Okay. We have two speakers tonight. We have um, two of our wonderful scientists on our board. We have Deborah Ayers. She's a lifelong plant enthusiast. She has degrees in botany and plant ecology. She did her PhD at UC Davis, where she studied the population biology of El Dorado mules ears, which is one of the rare species at Pine Hill. And while she was there at UCD, she focused on the rapid evolution of weeds, don't we love them, invasion of tidal marshes by cord grasses and hybrid speciation in tumbleweeds. But she also found time to work on rare species in the chaparral, in vernal pools and on plant communities of Pine Hill, which is a special love of hers. She's retired now and is vice president of our chapter. And she, we're very happy that she's able to give part of this presentation. She's been doing some very interesting research there with Jenna Myers. Then our other speaker is Sue Bridding. She's been working to conserve and protect native habitats in California for over 25 years now. She got her PhD in biology from UCLA in 1992. And she's currently executive director for the Sierra Forest Legacy. That's a forest conservation organization here in the foothills uh, that focuses actually on the forest. Her primary area of interest is habitat and species conservation, conservation in the Sierra Nevada but she also has interest in policy development and that extends statewide. She provides technical review and advice on federal and state environmental policies, legislation and conservation practices. She's also served as a governor appointed member of the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection for seven years. She's been an active volunteer with the California Native Plant Society. She's actually a fellow with CNPS and she's been a board member at the chapter and state level since 1993. And she was actually instrumental in starting our El Dorado chapter. So we're very lucky to have these two talking to us now about Pine Hill, and I will turn this over to them. And remember, questions at the end. Okay, let's see. Uh, screen. Okay. Did I unmute myself? Crap. We can hear you. Yeah. We can oh. hear you. Well, good evening. And um, today I'm going to talk about the biology, ecology, and botany of Pine Hill. And Sue will be discussing uh, new preserves and the policies uh, dealing with the conservation of the rare plants at Pine Hill. This is a, a photograph by Wieslander from, I think, the 20s of Pine Hill. So what is Pine Hill? You can probably see that it is an actual geographical feature. It's a hill in the um, sort of the middle of a rescue Cameron Park, Salmon Falls. But more Deborah? than that, yes. Deborah, sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your screen. Are we supposed to be, is there a screen share supposed to be happening? Yes. We're seeing you, when, which is fine. Oh. But. Okay, thank you. Uh, screen share, I thought I did that. And then uh, I'm doing the screen share. I click that button. And then select the, there you go. There you go. Oh, good. Okay, sorry guys. You know, it's, the, it's I'm actually not as inept as I seem because uh, there are some advanced features. Uh, Zoom keeps coming out with new features and so, um, I have to relearn it a little bit. So let me show you the first screen on this Wieslander photograph from the 20s of Pine Hill. So a Pine Hill is this geographical feature, but it refers to this formation of Gabbro soil that extends from south of Salmon, uh, uh, Cameron Park to north of uh, Salmon Falls. And uh, Gabbro is a soil type that is derived from a Gabbro rock. And this rock came from the magma chamber of a volcano in the Pacific Ocean that was shoved into the foothills 145 million years ago due to plate tectonics. And here is this gabbro intrusion or formation, this pale pink. And I hope you can see that there are other soils adjacent and different to it. So it's a, an area which we call azonal soil. It's not like anything surrounding it. Do you see the bar on the top of my screen or do you see the whole screen? Hello? We see, um, 
the whole screen without the bar at the top. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so this area is at 30,000 acres and upon it grows 741 plant species and subspecies. 583 are native species and about 160 are introduced plants. Now I've heard people say that it has 741 native plants, it does not. It is subject to um, colonization by introduced species, introduced plant species, just like anywhere else in California. So between the two of them, um, quite a large number of plants, however. Eight species are rare and five species are listed as threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And they are the only plants in the county that are listed. So how does this compare with other uh, areas of the world in terms of plant diversity? Um, arguably the most diverse place on the planet is New Caledonia with 0.18 species per square kilometer. So I've made them all the same amount of area and, and, and totaled up all the species. Uh, Polynesia is 0.14. The California Floristic Province, which is essentially California uh, west of the crest of the Sierras, has a, just a fraction of what these places have. El Dorado County as a whole, you can see, is tremendously diverse for reasons that also influence diversity on Pine Hill, topographic diversity, the diversity of soil types and so forth. Now, when we look at Pine Hill, we can see that Pine Hill is seven times the diversity of El Dorado County and 3000 times more diverse in plant species as the state of California. And so we call it a biodiversity hotspot encompassing just 0.5% of the area of California, it contains about 7% of the plant taxa within California. So any preservation that occurs within these 30,000 acres is a lot of bang for the buck. The rare species that I'm going to mention tonight include the five listed species and a species of special concern. El Dorado, uh, sorry, Stebbins Morning Glory, Pine Hill Ceanothus, Pine Hill Flannel Bush, Lane's Butterweed, El Dorado Bedstraw, and El Dorado Mule's Ears. This is the species of concern whose range is entirely within the Gabbro and nowhere else in the world. Jim Wilson did his master's degree looking at plant diversity of the, of the Pine Hill Gabbro and other, other adjacent uh, areas of different soil type. He, uh, it was a massive amount of work. And his master's thesis formed the basis for the listing of the five rare species in 1996. So four of the plants are endangered, one of the plants is threatened. And then in 2009, Jim and I and a couple of other scientists worked together to bring this master's thesis into the light of the world in this paper. And I'm going to be talking about some of the conclusions that we reached from this later paper. So what is the Pine Hill Preserve? It isn't one thing. Here is Pine Hill, and indeed there is an ecological preserve that surrounds Pine Hill, which I'll be talking about later. But we have a, a preserve Ponderosa 50, all the way up to uh, Salmon Falls Road, a series of preserves trying to capture the total diversity of this really, some places, highly developed section of the Gabbro soil. We have almost 4,800 acres that are under various uh, ownerships. In general, the Bureau of Land Management oversees the care of this land. Chaparral, uh, this 60% of the area is covered with chaparral, is a shrub dominated vegetation with which we are all familiar. It's controversial, you'll see why in a minute. The rare species generally occur as understory plants with the exception of the bed straw, which prefers to grow under oaks. It is dominated by manzanita, white leaf manzanita and chemise. And this is why it's controversial. It burns really well. Um, I took this picture. I was on a hillside wondering whether I could run uphill fast enough to escape the fire. And this was a control burn here, the firefighters and the water hose that they drug down half a mile. 
um, it is a natural part of chaparral dynamics. This isn't uh, exceptional. It's certainly startling, but it's a natural part. Fire restarts plant selection back to chaparral. So chaparral, after it burns, will never become a forest. It will only come back to chaparral unless it burns too frequently, in which case it becomes a grassland, which we consider not good. Patches in different stages of recovery after fire contain different sets of species leading to temporal diversity. So in addition to the geographical diversity we might have, we also have a temporal diversity. Plants have different strategies to cope with fire. Resprouters have underground structures, rhizomes, tubers, bulbs, corms that are protected from the heat of the fire. And it's very, very hot. If you've ever burned manzanita in your fireplace, you regretted it, I'm sure. The resprouters now arise from these below ground structures that have been protected from the heat by two, three, four inches of soil. Similarly, the cedars can survive the heat of fire by being below uh, two inches in the soil. Nonetheless, it still gets pretty hot down there, 200 degrees centigrade. And the cedars then germinate from fire cued seeds. So the seeds need the heat of fire to crack dormancy. Sometimes they also need follow on cool, wet uh, uh, conditions like we get in winter to germinate. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we found in this 09 paper. We found that there are two subtypes of chaparral on, on the gabbro soils. Subtypes of, uh, that are mesic on the north and east facing slopes and more xeric chaparral on the south and west facing slopes. Now, it's not like there are two distinct chaparrals. Both of these are dominated by manzanita and chemise, but on these more moderate slopes, we also get some re-sprouters. Um, on these hotter slopes, we tend to get reseeding species. On the um, more moderate slopes, the re-sprouters are coffee berry, toyon, and redbud, and other species. And on the xeric slopes, manzanita, chemise, and ceanothus. Manzanita and ceanothus are killed by fire. Uh, um, the chemise can both re-sprout and reseed. And intriguingly, the rare species also fall within these two different subtypes of chaparral. The re-sprouting species of mule's ears, Lane's butterweed, and um, the bed straw, they are found on the re-sprouting north and east facing slopes, whereas the seeding rare species, the Ceanothus rodericii, the Calistagia uh, stevensii, and the Fremontodendron are found on the more xeric slopes coming back from seed. The Fremontodendron also re-sprouts. So what's important is that the rare species occur on both chaparral subtypes, depending upon how they cope with fire, re-sprouting or reseeding, And that for con conservation of all these species, both types of chaparral must be preserved. Common species like toyon or um, chemise can be used as indicators of appropriate habitat for the rare species. In other words, if we're looking for the mule's ears, we will, management for the listed species will differ based on the chaparral where it occurs. So prescribed burning is required for xeric chaparral to promote the germination of those rare species, whereas canopy removal is an option for mesic chaparral. So I'm gonna turn now to the research that came out just last fall. There are two papers in this special issue of the California Fish and Wildlife. The issue dealt with the effects of fire on California's natural resources. <clears throat> the first paper was authored, uh, first authored by Mario Clip, who was in charge of uh, establishing the perimeter fire break uh, statistician Molly Caldwell and Gina and I. Now, members of this chapter well know uh, what it's like to clear the perimeter of Pine Hill because we were active 
participants in that clearing. The idea was that a 70 foot cleared perimeter would surround the border of Pine Hill. It is landlocked by private the goal was to stop fire from moving in either direction, either from private property to the Pine Hill Preserve or from the Pine Hill Chaparral into the houses. And before they could do the clearing, they needed it to be botanically surveyed. And that's where we came in. We put almost 400 hours as a chapter surveying before they did the hand clearing. And then we spent 150 hours um, in the spring of last year, oh, the year before last, um, surveying again the cleared area. So we put a lot of effort into this uh, cleared perimeter, as many of you will remember. So <clears throat> the perimeter was hand cleared with pile burning. This is a very interesting technique, and it was really the only one that was available to CAL FIRE and CDFW. They couldn't get heavy equipment in there because of the surrounding private property. They certainly couldn't set it on fire because of the surrounding private property. And so they elected to come in with hand clearing, chainsaw wielding crews of criminals uh, to clear the, the vegetation that was taller than 18 inches. So they didn't clear down to the ground. And then these were placed in piles, which uh, we had identified as being free of rare species and then burning those piles. So that's the method of, of uh, clearing. And it was amazingly benign to the habitat. When they come in with bulldozers and uh, disturb the soil, uh, it can be many, many, many years or never before the vegetation recovers. This was a very gentle way of removing the shrubs. So we um, asked the question, all of us, how does the vegetation respond to hand clearing only versus hand clearing plus burning, looking at both exotic and the native species? We specifically focused on the densities and survivorship of Ceanothus rodericii with and without fire. That's one of the uh, endangered species. And how does wildlife respond to clearing? And that was assessed by motion detection cameras. So here's the area we are talking about with which you are now very familiar. This is um, the area in El Dorado County. This is the perimeter of Pine Hill that was um, cleared and examined. The blue triangles were where motion detection cameras were placed in a cleared area. The squares were uh, uncleared areas that had cameras. And this is where we did our vegetation um, analyses and surveys. So here's what it looks like on the ground. We have a burn scar. That's where the pile was placed. And, and then we chose an adjacent plot in a random direction. And we examined that area as well. We looked at all the plans and ID'd them as to species and cover in both of these plot types. We also looked at survivorship of the Ceanothus. And to do this, we put a nail next to a seedling. Here's a little seedling uh, uh, Ceanothus rodericii. And then when we return and find a nail and no plant, we know that plant has died. So we looked at survivorship that way. So turning now to the components of the vegetation, native versus um, exotic. This is uh, the stacked bar and the top of the bar is the total number of species uh, that were there. This is percent cover and this is the number of species. This is the intact adjacent chaparral vegetation dominated by Manzanita. These are our burn treatments and this is the cleared only no burning. So the first thing we noticed looking at percent cover was, well, first, first of all, the cover in attack chaparral is greater than 100% because of multiple layers of vegetation that overlap. So we have more than 100% cover. But what we found was that there was a single exotic species that accounted for almost 50% of the cover in intact chaparral, Brachypodium distachyon. 
This is an interesting and, and evil non-native grass. It germinates in the fall. In fact, it's, it's probably germinated and there's a little grass plant out there now. And it can survive both in full sun and under the shade of a dense chaparral canopy. It grows to about three, four feet tall, flowers, and then dies. And what this does is it puts this fine dead fuel right into the branches of the canopy of the intact chaparral. So we believe um, this is a fire promoter in chaparral. It probably occurs in more than just our gabbro chaparral. So a nasty plant. We also found it occurred throughout these sites. So it survived fire, survived hand clearing. It's a pernicious, pernicious weed for the chaparral. So <clears throat> again, looking at percent cover, the fire certainly, certainly reduced the cover um, of all the vegetation. Some weeds came in. In the cleared areas, they responded with higher cover because we didn't take out the salvia sonomensis or any of these low growing things. So they added to the, the cover of these cleared sites. Looking at now the species richness, the species per square meter, you can see that the lowest species diversity is in the intact chaparral. As the chaparral grows up, that temporal diversity that I mentioned earlier after fire goes away. We don't have a series of species coming in and going out. We just have species going out until we're left with the manzanita chemise uh, species uh, there and, and salvia sonomensis, the Sonoma sage. That's basically what you find in intact chaparral. On the other hand, we have a, a pretty tremendous diversity going on in the burned and cleared and also in the clear. These letters indicate that there's really no difference in the species diversity among these three types. We will be, uh, we didn't look at it this spring or last spring because of the COVID. So we don't know exactly what it did during the second and third year following fire, but we do intend to go back and map it uh, perhaps every two and three years and see what the eventual fate of these plots are. Uh, turning now to the Ceanothus, we did not find established plants in the burn scars because the crews were specifically told to avoid cutting this plant down and fire kills this plant. What we found is that these seedlings occurred pretty much only on the burn site. The cleared site had very uh, few seedlings coming in. The survivorship again measured with the nails. This is came, we came back in the fall. Here's the nail and here's the plant. And you can see it grew and we also measured the growth. And here's a nail and here's a dead plant. So we can tell that this seedling died of the summer drought. Okay, now I'm gonna try and do this. Let's see, screen sharing, new share. Okay, let's see. Cross your fingers. Um, there we go. New share, share. Can, can you see that it's different? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, you can see. I've got yep. this. Okay, so I want to show yes. this video. You might want to okay. make it big. Yeah, I am. Let's see. Multitasking here. All right. So this is the video uh, from the cameras that Mario put out around.
Oops. Oops, that wasn't right. Okay. Now oh, crud. Trying. New share. Uh, we did that. Uh, we did that. Try letting go of the screen, Please. share, and then going back to. Oh, crap. Oh, here? No. Oh, here. Okay. All right. We can, we're back at the PowerPoint, are we? No, no. we're still seeing the video. There you go. Now we got okay. it. Okay. Okay. So I thought that was extremely cool. The, the neighbors who had a, a llama slaughtered by mountain lions. <laughs> reported that mountain lions had now accessed the preserve through the cleared perimeter. Mountain lions and bears, oh my. So um, his data, uh, their data looked like this. It was detection probabilities. <coughs> and I hope you can see that for all of these animals that we, we just saw, that the probability of detecting them in the cleared perimeter was far higher than in the uh, intact vegetation. We are working on the hypothesis that the um, herbivores, uh, like the rabbits and the mule deer, tended to feed in the clear perimeter because it was resprouting. There were weeds coming in. It was nice, succulent, lush vegetation for them to feed on. And then um, the uh, predators followed the herbivores. So the second paper I want to talk about is um, one of our a threatened species of Pine Hill, Pacara lanii. And this was work where uh, we work with Melanie Google Procurat, who was at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Laura Fady, who was a, a conservation uh, organization employee. We combined three separate studies looking at the habitat occupancy before and after disturbance, either by clearing or fire. Melanie uh, did this work for her PhD and she crawled around the chaparral like nobody's business, looking at um, intact chaparral vegetation, which was impenetrable, to see if she could find this plant under that intact vegetation, looking at sites that had been cleared with bulldozers and, um, and looking at um, uh, fire of unknown unknown when that fire occurred. And then Laura, uh, Lauren and I, we looked at um, what happened with this species after a fire in 2007. We also combined this with the surveys that our chapter did around Pine Hill. And um, we found that this species was present under the intact vegetation. And when that chaparral was cleared off, they resprouted. So, this species survives the interfire period. It doesn't die out as was once postulated, uh, and, it, and it comes back. How does it come back? Well, this is where we looked at it after the Ponderosa 50 fire in 2007. So our study sites was Ponderosa 50 Preserve, Pine Hill, and then uh, Melanie looked everywhere on the Gabbro Chaparral. This is our Ponderosa 50 site. This is the perimeter of the fire in 2007. And Lauren very carefully mapped every single patch of the Pacara across this burned area. And I hope you can see that it is not uniformly distributed across this area. It occurs in these various patches. Now the letters indicate the patches that we sampled for genetic fingerprinting analysis. This is what it looked like the year after fire. There were these patches that contained greater than 40, sometimes only a few, but sometimes greater than 40 of these re-sprouting clumps. We didn't find any plants with cotyledons, meaning there were no seedlings coming in. These were all re-sprouts from underground structures that survive the fire by virtue of being underground. 
So we, uh, these are two of the patches that we collected samples for, for DNA analysis. We attempted to get the, uh, the entirety of the patch. And we wanted to ask the question, when, when we see plants growing in patches like this, let's go back one. When I see this anyway, we tend to think that they're clonal, that this is actually one individual that spread over uh, the decades or the centuries via rhizomes like the Waithia particulata, the mule's ears does, to encompass um, patches of area that are essentially one single genetic individual. They are clones. So that's, I went in there with the notion that I was looking at clonal patches. Nonetheless, um, I did the genetic fingerprinting to determine if that was true. So are those patches a single genetic individual or are they composed of multiple individuals? And it turns out that both were true. All samples from a couple of the patches were distinct genetic individuals that arose from seeds. They had distinct genetic fingerprints. But all samples in patch A, which you saw, had identical genetic fingerprints, suggesting it was a single clone that had spread over three meters. And other patch patches had a mixture of both um, clonal spread, perhaps, and seedling establishment. So that was kind of a surprise to me anyway. <clears throat> so we concluded the story of the Pacara is that it survives fire clearing and the interfire period. And in this case at Ponderosa 50, it was over 80 years. Jenna's husband counted the tree rings of a black oak that was killed by the fire. And there was, was it over 80 Jenna? Over 80 rings. So it had been a long time since this area had burned and this plant survived or recruited under the chaparral. So underground rhizomes was unexpected as it's described as only having codices, which are um, underground structures that are limited in, in extent. We don't know when this plant recruits from seedlings. We know that it did and it does, but we don't know when or how. So the conservation um, uh, takeaway is that populations should be preserved until we understand whether we can rec recreate new populations. Another paper that came out uh, last fall was by Dylan Burge, who we are familiar with. He gave a, an excellent talk on bees a few years back to our chapter. And he looked at the conservation genomics of Waithia reticulata, the mule's ears. So um, let me walk you through this. And I'm gonna do it by analogy. If you've ever submitted your saliva to ancestry.com, you will get back output that actually is, is this. Each, each one of these bars is an individual. These are all the individuals sampled in this particular population. So ancestry gets back to you and says you're 50% you know, Irish. <clears throat> well, how does that happen that you're 50%? How can they tell? Well, historically and ancestrally, people were born, mated, and died in a very small area so that they were uh, more closely genetically related to the people in their village than they were to a village 300 miles away, for example, structure. We don't, we're all, not all alike all across the landscape. We tend to form these groups genetic groups based on how far we move um, and where we pick our mates from. So to take the ancestry.com a little bit further, if we were to say the black bar, the black proportion is Irish, we can say that this particular population was really dominated by Irish. A lot of, uh, in fact, these individuals over here are 100% Irish. If gray is English, we can see that this individual here is 100% English. If white is French, this individual here is 100% French. But by and large, most of these individuals kind of contain a mixture of, of Irish, English, and French. So I hope that's, that's clear. So 
this structure software, which is really cool, this is the kind of output you get. What structure does is uh, it identifies those historical ancestral populations within the genetic data and then categorizes each individual as to the proportion uh, membership that it exhibits. Is, is it Irish? Is it English? Is it French? So it's a, a really cool technique. So what Dylan did is he applied this technique to seven populations, the uh, uh, entirety of the species range from Cameron Park to Salmon Falls. And he did the structure analysis of all of these populations. And I hope you can see that these populations in the center and this one in the far north, there's a lot of Irish going on in there. There's some English and French. This one has a lot of French. But there's a lot of Irish going on there. This is kind of a, they all kind of look similar in having majorly Irish components in their background. But I hope you can also see that there are these two populations. And this isn't even the far north one. This is very close. These two populations are very close, except there's a river, river between them, um, which has resulted in this being distinct and different. It's mostly English, if we continue with our ancestry. We have some Irish, we have some French, we have a lot of English in this population. It's completely different from these other populations. And down here in the south, and this is about three miles separate from the Cameron Park group, it's mostly French. We have some Irish in here and some English in here, but it's mostly French. So not only is this completely different from these, it's completely different from that one. So how does that happen? Well, these divergent populations arise when pollen doesn't move or seeds don't go. Um, so there's no transfer of genetics. It's like a, a village in Southern Ireland is not going to be similar to a village in uh, say Southern England because they don't or didn't historically exchange members. And so you have divergent populations. Another explanation is that each of those populations have gone through their own separate evolutionary trajectory through natural selection. Now we can't tell the difference between restrictions in seed and pollen movement and evolution by natural selection. If we were to mix those populations up, we could break up adapted gene complexes, which is a no-no. We try to maintain the evolutionary potential of the species by not doing that. And so the word is to not mix populations. Um, finally, in this research, I do want to mention this excellent study that was done by Dylan Bird Burge and Landon Eldridge. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's in our new letter, along with species. This fabulous picture by Lisa Cooper. Oh my goodness, this perished by me, and this beautiful picture by somebody else. Um, the most interesting conclusion that Dylan and Landon came up with is that going to favor um, specific pollinators that seem to have a large role pollinating the rare species is not a, a particularly productive approach. A better approach would be to encourage those species that have a disproportionately high number of bees associated with them um, to increase the whole um, uh, support for pollinators. And one of those species, the species with the highest a number of bees on it is El Dorado mules ears. 40 species of bees were found to, to visit it. Lastly, and I'm almost done, I will lead into Sue. This is a parcel that was acquired by El Dorado County um, a year, year and a half ago in Shingle Springs, Cameron Park. It is bordered on the north by Highway 50 and on the south by Duroc Road. It's a 50 acre parcel that has been highly abused by off-highway vehicles, as you can see the trails, because it's been completely open for decades and they have taken advantage of it. In October of last year, there was a four acre fire approximately here. And they suspect that a car driving down Highway 50 was shooting sparks out and set the chaparral on fire. 
And as we know, fire is a seminal event in the chaparral. It's very exciting. Things are popping, things are germinating. Um, and we hope that we will be able to, the, we the chapter and our volunteers will be able to assist the county in evaluating the effect of this fire on rare plant populations. We also would like to do some weeding. Stinkwort is in the area and is known to invade burnt sites. So we would like to also weed in this area. So I'm gonna stop here and turn it over to Sue if we can, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not quite sure how to stop my sharing. So- um, Click on the same green button. New share? No, I think, I don't think so, but Sue, perhaps you could click on share your screen. Okay, whoops, I can't have to turn that. I know I should probably have to stop that, but darn if I can figure out how to do that. Stop share, I stopped it, okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. So we'll take questions at the end if um, perhaps you wanna put them in the chat. I think I looked, did we lose Sue? I don't see her name on here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, you all chat while I find Sue. <laughs> I don't know what happened I'm to her. I'm wondering, hopefully she didn't have a problem with um, the electricity. Um, Deborah, we did have one question from Madeline. Did you want to ask your question directly so you can explain it to Deborah? Yes. For sure. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for, for that. That was really great. You're so darn cute. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so I was just asking if you would repeat the species that you usually find in chaparral. You mentioned there are specific species that usually show up in chaparral. Uh, so are we talking about resprouting species or seeding think, species? Or I think it was when you were talking about the, the bad weed, that really bad weed. <clears throat> Oh. Well, just in general, I guess the reason I'm asking the context is just to know, um, you know, if you're in a, sh if you're trying to rehabilitate a chaparral or if you're, you know, looking, if you're walking through one, what should you expect to see or what would you expect to be growing with things like um, uh, manzanita and um, I mean, what else, you know, chemise and different things. What normally... She meant the Sonoma Sunwensis, I think, is what she was referring to. Yeah, the manzanita, the Sin salvia. You mentioned some of the common uh, chaparral species. Yeah. Well, really, it's nice to see your name there after so long. Um, so <laughs> I would expect to see walking through um, any of the chaparral. Yeah, uh, I, do. Manzanita, I just got a message uh, from Sue. I'm sorry, her power just went out. <laughs> it's out in her office and also at home. So she's she's gone for the evening. So take it away with questions, Deborah. Oh, okay. that's a shame about Sue. Okay, so, so keep going, Deborah. Sorry. So, um, if I was walking through uh, the Cameron Park Preserve, for example, or on Pine Hill, I would expect to see white leaf manzanita and chemise. If uh, and a ground cover of Sonoma sage. Oh my goodness. That, I know it occurs in other chaparrales, but it is almost ubiquitous in chaparral, in our Gabbro chaparral. Uh, it's a low growing salvia, very aromatic uh, or stinky as the case may be, does not get eaten by anything. It grows in the full sun and it grows under the shade of a, a intact established dense chaparral canopy. And Jenna and I have been paying particular attention to Sonoma sage, Salvia sonomensis, because we don't know how it survives fire. We um, have looked at the burn scars from the Pine Hill work. We have looked at the fire at Cameron Park. We are always looking for Salvia sonomensis. How does it survive fire? And what we are tentatively concluding is that it doesn't which is kind of amazing um, for a chaparral species to have no mechanism of surviving fire. It doesn't re-sprout within fire sites. We don't see seedlings in fire sites. What we do see, and it is a tremendous ground cover, is it comes in from the edges of fire 
grows into the fire and then roots, presumably of flowers and seeds. And so it recolonizes fire sites um, through clonal spread and seeding, which is kind of amazing. And that is the third way plants deal with fire. They can resprout, they can reseed, or they could recolonize. Now, is that in is that in general in chaparral, or is that mainly uh, in no, arborist soils? Most of them, most of them seem to have a mechanism of surviving fire. And in fact, Gina and I, there's a <clears throat> a chaparral sedge, Carex <clears throat> xerophyllum, drought loving sedge. It was recently uh, uh, a rename. Carex brainardii was recently determined to be a new species, Carex xerophylla. And we wondered how that thing survives fire. And we saw it at the Cameron Park Reserve re-sprouting. Some, some of the clumps were clearly toast. So who knows, maybe they'll come back after this rain. But some of them were re-sprouting and Jenna even found flowers on one of these little sedges. So that's kind of a mystery solved. For chaparral ecologists, we're always taking note of whether the species resprouts or recedes, or in the case of the Sonoma sage, has to recolonize. Now I saw a question go floating back that said how, how much area of the Gabbro chaparral has been uh, preserved. And it's a, you know, pushing 5,000 acres and it's a 30,000 acre area. So about one sixth of the area has been preserved. Um, and it's uh, uh, El Dorado County was forced to do this back in uh, the 90s. It was determined that because we draw water from a federal project, the Bureau of Reclamation Water, that there was a, a, a linkage between our housing development in this area and the um, endangerment of these species, that the more water we took from the feds, we are actually going to use to destroy listed species. And so that was how the feet of El Dorado County were held to the fire. They were forced basically to start mitigation funding. And then I wish Sue was here because the, the mitigation funding uh, aspect is really important. Um, so that's why El Dorado County was forced to participate in the preservation of these areas. Deborah, um, we also have, I'm sorry, you're still going on that? No, I see a question, but yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I think that's Bass Lake Regional Park. Um, someone's wanting to know if you would suggest a small study area to burn and hand clear some areas of chaparral as an educational study area to be associated with a future nature. The uh, uh, Bass Lake is off the Gabbro. So, uh, you know, um, years and years ago, somebody from Elder can't you find a, an endangered species because we don't want them to develop it and no there was not endangered species the only endangered species in El Dorado County are on the are on the Gabbro soil so I think Bass Lake is just off um, the road. Um, someone said about seed recruitment of the Lane's butterweed no I don't see the uh, let's see let's look at the chat oh any of the area open to public, <clears throat> excuse me. It used to be uh, the Bureau of Land Management would organize plant hikes in the spring. We, uh, the chapter, took over that task from the Bureau of Land Management three or four years ago. And we have had uh, hikes through um, Sal's, Pine Hill itself, and the Cameron Park unit for each, each of those years. Of course, we didn't have it last year and we likely will not have it this year, where you kind of want to go you know, April, May-ish. So um, areas open to the public. Uh, Pine Hill itself, the neighbors, actually one neighbor in particular, decided that the public should not be allowed up on Pine Hill. Pine Hill Preserve is owned by the state of California, but the road is by the people who live along it. And so they have completely closed it off to the public so the opportunity to see Pine Hill through tours from the CNPS is actually quite, uh, quite a privilege to be able to do that. Um, the Cameron Park unit is open to the public. You can access the trails off Sudbury Road, um, or you can access um, the trails off Meter Road. Uh, the trails are kind of rocky, 
Uh, you need hiking boots, but you can access that. Salmon Falls, you can access off. Um, uh, well, I don't think you can access that. Um, yeah. So there Kanaka are various Valley. points. Kanaka Valley Road. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, Kanaka Valley. Is it Kanaka Valley Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where the pullout is? Yeah. Yeah. So you can access Kanaka Valley. It's um, been highly disturbed through grazing through the decades, is what I'm assuming, because the valley uh, that you walk through is a grassland oak woodland, but still very interesting. And then once you start climbing out of the valley, you start encountering the chaparral and the rare species. It is uh, now the El Dorado in the Pine Hill Preserves. Let's see, where was this? Let's capture Chelsea's question there. She wants to know if you've seen any lane butterweed recruitment by seed after clearing and fire at Pine Hill or whether it's just re-sprouts. It's, it's interesting that you should ask that question. When, uh, when we were surveying the perimeter of Pine Hill after the clearing, so that was a year ago last spring, we saw seedlings occurring very, very close to where clumps were re-sprouting. So they, they had recruited. And then Jenna and I did a partial resurveying of the Ponderosa 50 site la, uh, last spring. And um, so, so, you know, when the plant flowers abundantly, then you're gonna get seedlings. Oddly enough, Melanie Google Prokurat also observed it flowering pretty intensely under the chaparral canopy. And it had seeds, she didn't test them to see whether they were viable or not. So the, um, the opportunity certainly exists for recruitment to occur under intact chaparral and after clearing. And these re-sprouting species seem to need um, nurse plants. Uh, the seedlings require some sort of cover to mitigate the sun. And this is part of their biology. In fact, uh, John Keeley, who's um, uh, uh, best uh, known California chaparral ecologist says that the difference between the reseeders and the resprouters re actually require this vegetation for their seeds to establish. So they don't need fire, they need some protection whereas the reseeders need the heat of the fire to germinate. And what's even more fascinating is, well, why do you get reseeders on such a harsh exposure? And it's very hot, the summer drought is fierce. And it turns out the seedlings of reseeders have a tremendous ability to suck water off of soil particles. They develop amazing pressure and are able to actually drink out of that dry soil, whereas normal plants can't handle that kind of drought. They just, they just can't suck the water off the soil. So the, the whole thing that seems to drive the distribution of these species is things can handle drought. It's kind of, kind of fascinating. I'm, Im I'm imagining the mycorrhizae handing them a glass of water. Uh, I, I, you know, and I don't know anything about uh, mycorrhizal attachments. I'm sure they're there after fire. I'm not so sure. Um, it gets pretty darn hot and um, there might not be a, a whole lot of mycorrhizae left in that soil. Might be a long recovery time before they come back. I don't know. I have no papers. I don't know of any papers or any studies that have looked at that directly. Uh, Jenna, maybe you? Oh, say that again. I was anything about uh, anything about mycorrhizal attachments in the chaparral and, and how quickly I, they might come back after. Spring. I don't know anything about it, but I would be very fascinated to find out about that. Yeah. That would be really cool. These are tough things to study, as you can imagine. They're yeah. microscopic and probably very apachally distributed. So, okay, so, I see. Is wondering specifically how someone could access the preserve area that's along the South Fork of the American River. Probably from, um, you know, that parking lot at uh, where the bridge crosses the river at Salmon Falls. Uh, you go up Salmon Falls Road, and then there's a bridge that crosses the South Fork of the American, and there's a parking lot. Talking about, so you you can park there. 
and actually hike toward that um, the um, the Salmon Falls Preserve. It's kind of discouraging because the initial hike is, um, you know, that steep. <laughs> you got to crawl out of the parking lot to get up. The way I accessed it years and years ago was um, there was a, a gate. It was a, a small road off Salmon Falls Road and there was a gate and I, I got access through it. Um, but I think that road is long since the field road is gone. So I'm not quite sure. There's another, th there's another place, the Acorn Trail from um, Trailhead uh, through uh, the American River Conservancy, which is a little bit further north um, off Salmon Falls Road. Um, that does go into a portion of the Salmon Falls unit of the preserve. And Deborah, I'm going to sneak in a question here of my own. <laughs> um, I know in Southern, the whole thing about chaparral being fire, you know, needing fire and all that. I know in Southern California, um, the frequency is so much higher now than it used to be. Um, and so this whole thing about fire adapted, I thought was sort of a myth that the chaparral really isn't fire adapted. At least that's what they say down there. And maybe I'm wrong on that. And maybe you already addressed this, but up here on our chaparral and especially in the Pine Hill chaparral, is it actually fire adapted? And how is the frequency now compared to what it would have been naturally? You know, these are things that I have puzzled about for years. As regards Southern California, the fire frequency across the border in Mexico, because of course there, there isn't the housing to uh, put those fires out. And I think they, they came up with a fire frequency of around 30 years, 30 years for that Southern California chaparral. The problem occurs when the fires occur every other year, in which case the, 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 the plants that require the fire to germinate, they've all germinated. So there's no more seeds in the soil seed bank to come back after fire. And what happens is that the chaparral is invaded, this area, the fire areas are invaded by these grassy weeds then are turned it into grass. It exceeds the capacity of the plants to regenerate after fire when fire occurs um, every two or three years. That is one of the, um, what, uh, what I identified in the recovery plan, one of the main hazards of the preserves now is that if fire crosses the borders through high frequency fires, we will lose uh, those reseeders. We will lose the Ceanothus rodrichii. We'll lose the, uh, the, um, the morning glory. We will, we will lose these plants. The generative capacity will have been exceeded. What is the fire frequency in Northern California? I do. The, the fires that I have dated, well, mine was 80. Jenna, what did your husband count? Was it 80 or 90 rings? is over our heads. The manzanita is over our heads. It's so tall. It's so old. And I am not going to say senescent. As people say, oh, well, that's senescent chaparral and it should burn us. I, I don't know that. I don't know that it's dying. Uh, I, I have no, no information that anything past 80 years, you should light it on fire. Nobody really knows what the natural frequency of fire is in our Northern California chaparral. I looked at fire records when I was doing my PhD research and it was amazing the number of fires, they called it a, a rug rat fire. It was children playing with matches mm -hmm. and the fires that occurred on the 4th of July and the 5th of July because people were throwing firecrackers and lighting off whatever. So the influence of human caused fire is really hard to tease out of fire frequency data. Ideally, it would just be lightning caused fire, but then we're there putting out the fire. And so it's, um, it's kind of a great unknown. 
Okay. Did that sort of answer your question yes, very, more than very much. Than you that was, no, that was very helpful. Thank you. And then Al Ludke is wondering also, how many plant species have you found the very next year after fire? Oh. Uh, that's a good question. I that's a good question. I can't no, remember she exactly. <laughs> she uh, she studied a fire off Nieder Road with her class, her advanced botanist uh, and advanced field ecology. And she's she's a real botanist. She knows plants. Um, well, um, over in Pine Hill in our little uh, test spots in the cleared area um, that were burned, I think that we saw in the in individual plots maybe up to about twenty species. Yeah, I, I can't remember exactly, but over all the plots. Um, I'm guessing there were, I don't know, I'm guessing somewhere around 40, 40, 50 species, something like that. Yeah, that our species list is about, is about that. 50, yeah, yeah. 50 species, that includes weeds too. And that was, that was the first year after, uh, the first and second year after the fires. Okay, great. And then Julie Horenstein was wondering whether you used a Geiger counter <laughs> to relocate the, the nails. Uh, no. Okay. Well, that would be scary. Yeah, we put yeah. the uranium nails in and then um, they were actually roofing nails, that nice broad head. No, they were quite visible. They are uh, visible. Mm -hmm. And the plots are not huge. I mean, the, the, the fire uh, patches are two to three meters in diameter. So it's they're readily searchable. Oh, I didn't mean a Geiger counter. I shouldn't have said that. I meant a metal detector. Metal you meant metal. <laughs> it's late. That's what I tried to use in vernal pools with nails. It didn't work. Oh, why not? <laughs> uh, okay. it, and then, it just didn't work. <laughs> I have two questions that are related that have to do with clearing for fire. Um, one is from Madeline, and she wants to know how the Pine Hill flannel bush, the Montedendron decumbens, responds to fire clearing. And then also, though, Lester wants to know um, what the effect is of treating the borders of the preserves to maintain defensible space and whether that leads to loss of species. Oh, oh interesting. So, Jen and I have expanded our uh, research to the, um, not the south side? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The south side. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> we're uh, lit on fire um, in the winter no. of 19. And uh, you might want to bring Ollie in here. Did someone mute themselves? Uh, and what, ben, you what could mute yourself, please. The, uh, that southern border has the highest density of flannel bush. Uh, we have counted something like 25 separate plants. Uh -huh. um, we have ben Benjamin, could you, Benjamin, could you please mute yourself? <laughs> oh, well, let's sorry. mute him. Okay. As host, you can mute him. I have this bo button that says mute all. The power. Oh, my God. I can mute everyone. This is so great. Okay, David, I'm muting you. Oh, no, he's, he's muted. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> you forget that you're, you're actually live. So uh, Jenna and I decided to set up plots on the south side at, after this recent fire. And surprise, surprise, in the fire scars, we found seedlings of Fremontodendron. And the nearest plant was six to 12 meters away. That's a long way, the adult plant and we didn't find any seedlings in the area that just been cleared and not burned. So seedlings only in the burn site. And then um, we kind of looked at uh, on the edges and the plant also grows, uh, uh, the roots can also re-sprout stems. And so the plant can grow both conally and by seeds. Now we deliberately tried to avoid burning the free monodendron. However, Alice and Lester found a free montedendron on one of our paths that had been cut down to make the path through which we surveyed it. And um, when uh, Jenna and I do the genetic uh, collections uh, in May of this year, crossing, crossing fingers, 
I would like to take a couple of samples from these re-sprouting Fremontodendron because I think they are clones that were able to re-sprout after being cleared. Now, how did those seedlings get six, eight, nine meters away from their source? You might wonder, I wondered. Ants, native harvester ants. This is a species that has seeds with elysosomes attached to them. And elysosomes are fatty, protein-rich bodies that the plant sticks on its seeds specifically to attract ants. So the ants collect the seeds with the elysosomes, take them back to their nest, chew off the elysosomes, and the, the seed coat is so hard they, they can't chew into the seed, and so they dump it on their midden pile in their garbage dump. Hmm. So that's how the seeds move away from the plant they're in the garbage dump of these harvester ants, which is very cool. Yeah. Are you talking south of 50 when you say south? No, no. South of Pine Hill. This is work that we are carrying out in the Pine Hill perimeter where we have these burn scars. So we have replicated fire, which you don't get in Chaparral. You get one fire in lots of plots. Here we have replicated fire, which is very cool. So we're doing a lot of work in this cleared perimeter where we compare uh, can compare the effect of fire and the effect of clearing as separate disturbance events. So everyone, oh, I, this is great being able to ask questions and I'm not gonna stop this, but I do want to go ahead and officially stop the meeting for those who want to um, move on. But um, that was really interesting, Deborah. thank you so much. And again, we're going to do some more questions after afterwards for anybody who wants to stay. But I did want to say one thing too. Uh, we want to apologize as a chapter to those of you that may have gotten messed up on our email. Our email list has some problems. We lost some people. If you haven't been getting your emails, please um, somehow let us know, maybe through our website. And we do definitely apologize. We're working on trying to fix that problem. And next, um, our next general meeting, as always, is in two months. That, so that will be the fourth Tuesday night in March. And the speaker that time will actually be myself. And I'll be talking about living with wildfire and um, both having a, a system of both defensible space and hardening your home, how the two go together. Also presenting some of the latest science on what has helped homes survive and the impact of all. Okay, so I think we're going to But let's keep going with questions. I should mention that our chapter so much uh, mandates, dictates, suggests, whatever, that we talk about Pine Hill once every two or three years. And so this is our, you know, last time we mm -hmm. talked about it was three years ago because this is literally in our backyard. And um, you know, it's felt when these bylaws are passed that people in the chapter should be aware that they have this incredible biodiversity hotspot right in the backyard. So um, there is a previous talk, a PDF of a previous talk that has been posted. Uh, I uh, gave a talk for CDFW um, seven years ago, which is also uh, on the website. And if you're interested in the science that we do in this county, there is a page that talks about science in it both here and at the Blodgett National. So the, these are these pockets of places where scientists do work, and Pine Hill is one of them. And if you are interested in any of those papers that are listed in the bibliography, uh, just email me. I'd be happy to send you a PDF of those papers. Okay, so. Okay, great. So um, Al has a question here about in the coast ranges, he's seen extensive patches dominated by chimneys and areas that are otherwise diverse shrubs. Are those not fire scars? Uh, I'm sorry, are those what? Not fire scars. No. Um, that's a good question. Uh, sites that are dominated by chimneys. I don't know. Do you have an opinion, Jenna? Um, it could Somebody be. has uh, uh, something going on behind them, uh, uh, a television or something. If you could please mute. 
Okay. I too have seen, you know, these uh, typical patches. How do they originate? The chemise can both re-sprout and reseed, certainly after fire. I don't, do you have a feeling about whether it's more drought tolerant than manzanita, for example? Jenna? I would Is anyone else hearing anything? I'm getting silent. Other species. Whoops. I think I'm still here. Jenna, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear I you. Know. Okay, so um, I don't know of any study that has looked directly at the competition between uh, manzanita and chemise. What we've seen, Ajin and I have seen, is for a species that's supposed to come back from seed after fire, as our white leaf manzanita is, it doesn't have a burl, it's killed by fire. In fact, it's killed by being cut down. We don't see it re sprouting even from plants that have been cut. fire and the chemise is not. And so what you're looking at now might be a temporal, a temporal uh, phenomena. Okay, four new messages. Hey, great. I think that's it. We've got lots of thank yous and they really enjoy um, Deborah. Will it come back to be a fire hazard? Uh, since we haven't bulldozed it, we don't know. Um, other, other types of clearing suggest that within about 10 years, uh, you might have to redo what you did. What the Bureau of Land Management does is they have a, a masticator. So they will go um, along the perimeters and they will you know, basically chew up all the vegetation. Sometimes I think when they can, they have fires. I don't think they bulldoze, but the masticator is uh, more, uh, more of a disturbance than um, the hand clearing, of course, but the hand clearing is way more labor intensive than bringing a piece of heavy equipment in and just, just masticating all of the vegetation. So th they, they are very conscious of California. If they're not coming in too frequently, then the seed um, seed bed will still be there and whatnot. So it's not as bad as um, frequent fires. That's true, and it's. Yeah, that's my concern, especially with that side there that um, on off meter road. 
workers and um, stinkwort and other non-natives have uh, been a real problem there. Um, and then they, they did um, uh, put in a fire break in between that meter road site and the adjacent housing uh, some years ago. And that is full of non-native grasses, including harding grass. Um, so that would be my concern as well, is that I think that the uh, non-natives coming in could really um, uh, uh, be a problem for our rare plants there. And I, I would like to mention too that <clears throat> We have this new uh, invading species, the stinkwort. need invading a fire site, what's it going to do? And we don't really know. We know from Napa County that it goes crazy in burn sites. How does that affect the recruitment of our rare species or of our common species? Um, if it has a negative impact, we kind of want to weed it out before it can have that negative impact. So this is what the, the chapter wants to get involved with that Cameron Park fire, that four acres, and uh, maybe do a little manicuring and get that get that stink port out of there before it can impair the recruitment. We're in this changing environment. I'm not even talking about climate change. I don't even want to talk about climate. You have no idea what they're. It, you know, bulldozing is not a good solution to creating a fire break. I just want to kind of end with that. Someone said, I just plan to burn stinkwort on my street. Your neighbors would agree to that. I can't even spray Roundup, little, little tiny droplets of Roundup on stinkwort seedlings without some of my neighbors accusing me of poisoning their children. <laughs> so good luck burning. Good luck burning. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I actually had one more, just a little quick question. So you talked about the big animals you know, coming after the herbivores. Mightn't they also just prefer to walk where they can walk? I mean, like a big bear. Absolutely, really cool. Absolutely. Okay. and when you look at the statistics on the people coming in there, they're everywhere. And this is a concern. Right. What What is this foot traffic uh, you know, gonna do for that perimeter? But uh, yeah. And wasn't that cool? Mountain lions, a pair of mountain lions just sort of cavorting yes. in the, and a bear yes. or two bears. <laughs> yeah, know. it makes me uh, it makes me very aware now that I when I'm crouching over looking at the little plants and thinking. <laughs>